Planning Institute. Uh, both Paul and uh, uh, and Jack have been business owners. Both of them have exited from multiple businesses. Both of them have exited from multiple businesses under uh, stressful circumstances. Um, and uh, both of them have also um, helped and assisted uh, uh, others who are professional, let's call them guides, or others in navigating the, the transition planning process. So it's not just about exiting a business, it's about succession planning, it's about uh, who am I after I've exited the business? What's my identity? Uh, you know, what is it I want to do with the rest of my life? That sort of thing. Uh, but I don't want to give away any information or, uh, or budge anything. So I'll just let I'll let Paul introduce himself, and I'll let Paul begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kumi, and thank you for inviting me today. And uh, welcome everybody who made the call. And for those who are listening to this remotely later on, this is being recorded. And uh, you should all be receiving a recording of this within two days. So as Kumi said, um, a lot of the challenge that business owners face, and would be in Bermuda or, or anywhere in the world where I've spoken, is something's holding people back. You know, They understand that they need to plan about the future of their business and the future of their life, but often put it off for a variety of reasons, and, and sometimes, sadly, until it's really too late. So first I'd like to share stories. Uh, this is me on the left. And in 2008, I had made a decision to leave my business. I was part of a, a group of people who were building year-round indoor golf training centers throughout the US and Canada. We were also in China, and we were working on the Middle East. And uh, we were moving along. We had been raising some money. We had gotten things going. Um, and then the CEO and I uh, had a major blowout. And since he owned an awful lot more of the company than I did, uh, it clearly made sense for me to find a way to leave. And so we found a willing buyer to buy out my share. And I pocketed a, a small profit. I was happy to do about a 20% total return, which wasn't wasn't too bad. Uh, but it did take a few years of my life that I had been involved, and uh, I left, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself, and I have a home uh, on me. Cape Cod. Oh, may I just interrupt, interrupt you for one sec? When yes. When I see screen changes, I'm getting a message through from one of the attendees. Not seeing what change? The picture is changing on the slide. Um, okay. It went from what's holding you back to our stories? Yes. Did you see that? Um, no, we're not seeing that. You're not seeing that. Okay. Are you seeing anything on the screen? Okay, now we're seeing it. Ah. Now we're seeing finding your new owner. Okay. I'm sorry. I know what I clicked incorrectly. So what's holding you back? <laughs> um, and here's the stories. Here we go. There you go. Didn't really, didn't lose didn't lose too much. So. I got the money, wired hit my bank account, and I'm feeling really good about myself. I'm sitting on a beach with a favorite beer in my hand watching the sunset, and my phone buzzes, and there's a message. And it was Greg, who was still part of the old business, and Greg leaves me a message and says um, that the uh, we're happy for you, Paul. Um, I'm sorry, obviously, that you left, but uh, I only really have one question for you. What are you going to do next? I looked at the phone and I go, Greg, you son of a gun. I have no idea what I'm going to do next. You, he just killed my buzz. But I, it was the right question to ask because I really didn't have a plan. I had been doing a little management consulting on the side and moving my way forward in some way, but nothing really firm. And like a lot of people, I was floundering around. So someone suggested I go to a networking organization, and there I did. And I happened to sit down next to this distinguished-looking gentleman, Jack Beauregard. Jack asked me what I did, and I said, well, I, I help companies grow faster. I'm, I'm a sales and marketing guy, but I'm you know, trying to figure things out. Is it something you're interested in? And Jack said, maybe. I said, so what do you do? He said, well, you know how people get to a point in their career or their business, and they rec recognize that they need to leave, and sometimes they even negotiate a deal. And then either the deal falls through or they leave and they have a whole lot of regrets. And I'm laughing to myself saying, is this a setup? You know, it's just like the old TV show Candid Camera here. And I said, of course, I understand. And let's meet for coffee. Well, that, that initial conversation turned into 
a year of coffee meetings. And I asked Jack, well, you know, what's your story? How did, how did you come to this place in your life? And Jack is a, a, a deeply philosophical person. He grew up, if you will, in the orthopedics world, selling hips and knees for all the major companies here in the United States. And he and a group of surgeons in Boston got together many years ago, 20 years ago, and created the first, if you will, uh, generic parts. And uh, they were going great guns. And while all of this is happening, and he's having all this success, he decides to order a Mercedes in Germany. He was going to pick it up there and, you know, saw it manufactured and so forth. He had been building himself up that this is going to be this great accomplishment. He's going to have this tremendous feeling of success. And so they hand him the keys there in Stuttgart. And all he felt at that moment was emptiness. Rather than this great achievement, he was realized that, you know, this is just another thing. There's got to be more to life than more things. So he took it upon himself when he flew back to Boston and he to start studying. And he was accepted into a program at the Harvard Divinity School, not to be a theologian, but to do research. Well, along the way, he got married um, and a lovely woman, and they had a son. And while the business is growing and he's doing his studying and you know, raising a family, his wife gets cancer. And a short time later, she dies and leaves him with a two-year-old. And obviously, he's emotionally devastated. He's supposed to be flying around the country with distributors and customers and everything else. But he can't do any of that. And so he ended up leaving the company. And he needed time to mourn and to heal and to raise his son and to create a new life. Because underneath all of that is the success, that financial success that he had, wasn't bringing him the happiness that he wanted in his life. And he said, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to figure it out. And so what he did over time is really create a process for people to understand logically how you go through a transition from one place to the place you want to go. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. Um, as we go forward, we just want to remind people that we're going to have a series of uh, workshops in, um, in Bermuda, Finding a New Owner. Uh, there will be more information forthcoming from Kumi. It's uh, in October. And it's a half day. It'll be very fast paced. Um, you'll be able to take action, and you'll be listening to some leading experts. So, what are some things that hold people back from realizing what they really want to do? Well, there's sort of the big four A's, as we call them. There's attachment, addiction, aversion, and avoidance. So, here's another story. So, George is not his real name, but George is a CPA. Very well known in his community, been CPA for a long, long time. And he had been thinking about, I should do something with the business. He actually got involved with a group of people who do succession planning, and he was coaching other advisors and other business owners, I should say, on you know, how they would leave, but never really got around to putting his plans together. He kept putting it off. It's a bit of the, uh, the cobbler's shoeless son, as it were. And then George had a heart attack and almost died. And he realized, this is madness. I'm not getting younger. I'm getting older. And while he recovered from the heart attack, he realized that he needed to figure out what was important in his life. He needed to you know, heal thyself, physician. And he needed a process. So he knew of us, and he worked with one of our local consultants and put together a plan and was able to find a successor and bring her on board. And I recently ran into him at an event and I said, um, I said, gee, you know, you look great. How, you know, how are you feeling? He goes, I feel terrific. Things are great. And um, I said, well, where's your associate? And he goes, oh, you know, she's over there and she's networking and, you know, it's a partner going to be buying him out. He said, Paul, you know what's the greatest thing? He said, when I used to go to these thing, these events, people would just say, you know, they can't wait to talk to George, you know, or they bring people over and so forth. Now, when I go to these events with my partner, the first question I get is, you know, 
how's Susan doing? You know, is it moving along? And and now when people call, they really want to go to her. They, they're recognizing their transition. So people have been reading, communicating what I've been saying and getting it. So I'm feeling really good about her. I'm feeling good about the firm. We'll go forward. And I'm feeling good that the plans I've put together in my life are actually going to happen. So this is the story of Susan, not the one I just referred to. And this is someone who's a business coach, very successful, been doing it a long, long time, actually has a background in psychology. So you would think someone like this with this background would be very attuned to the fears and challenges and issues involved in transition and succession. And yet, she hadn't done the planning. And it was bothering her. She had you know, grown her business and she was working you know, quite busy, feeling good about all that, but like all of us, not getting younger, and had gotten connected into some other people who were in the succession planning space and, you know, once again was sort of bringing clients to this little group, collaborative team, and said, you know, it's time to you, for you to talk to these people about succession planning and sort of handing the client off, but never doing any of her own. Now, in her case, she, she actually wasn't a, an owner in the true sense of the word. She was part of this other organization um, kind of a 1099 in our lexicon, which is an independent contractor. But she really basically was responsible for generating her own business. And so even though she didn't um, have a business to sell per se, she in essence had a book of business. And in her situation was she really needed to come to a, a realization that there were many other things she wanted to accomplish in her life. And getting those other things accomplished would require her to change what she was doing. But she couldn't quite connect it. And she had all the fears involved and all that. And by following a logical process, she was able to not so much overcome the fears, but counterbalance the fears, realizing that she had the skill set to create this personal and business transition. And that, you know, her 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 clients in her groups would not be abandoned. It is a process involved in transitioning someone to take over and to create a revenue stream, an income stream to her over some period of time. So here's two different situations. Someone who, you know, owns a professional practice and, you know, need to do the formal process of transitioning to someone else. And someone in more of a independent contractor role with a book of business, but both of them needed, even though they had different business issues they had to evolve, resolve, the personal issues are universal, which is what people come to us all the time and just say, you know, what kind of clients do you work with? And we're basically saying anybody who's 50s and 60s and up and has a, really is struggling with the idea of succession and personal transition. So I referred to earlier, what's holding people back? Well, you know, if you hear someone saying, you know, I love my business, why would I ever leave it? Well, that means they're suffering from attachment. They're really having a hard time, you know, intellectually, emotionally detaching themselves from their business. And someone is in that mode, it's very difficult for them to move on. There are other folks who are so personally identified. You know, for example, how many times have you, you know, gone to a cocktail party and you meet somebody, you ask them what they do, and the response is, I'm a lawyer, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a CPA. But that wasn't your question. Your question wasn't, you know, what they do, or rather who they are. It was what they do. Now, a lawyer practices law. Could be various kinds of law. An accountant, those are the pluses and minuses. Maybe does taxes. And of course, the doctor helps people figure out what's wrong with them, diagnoses and so forth. But once that person leaves that role, whether you choose to call it retirement or leaving the business or selling or what have you, you have ripped out an enormous part of their personality. So this whole idea of I am what I do, well, no, you are who you are. And if you follow a process, you can really understand who you are and who the you you really want to be. Who will take it over? Now, this is a little oversimplified, but many business owners you know, may have children, um, may have some children in the business. 
Now, some of their children may be 40 or 45, but you know, they still think of the daughter as the princess, the son's a little cowboy, and God forbid they take over and run the business. They're not ready yet. On the other hand, they may have some employees involved, and they think, well, if I have the employees take it over, they'll just steal from me. They're not irrational fears, but they are fears, and they need to be counterbalanced with the reality. And with some good planning, you can find a way to do that. And then, of course, there's what we call the R and D method, which is simply repress and deny. Right? If you just ignore the fact that you're getting older, you ignore the fact that the business may need additional investment, if you ignore the fact that internal people are looking for their future and you're not listening to that, then those problems don't go away. You just don't want to think about it. Now, when you go through this sort of denial, you can end up with some really difficult, impulsive decisions. So I was talking to an advisor one time, and he said, you know, my biggest concern is I listen to people, and I talk to them about what they want to do with their business, and everybody's got a story. Well, you know, my buddy had a business, and it was very similar to mine, and, you know, when I asked him, you know, when he sold it, he goes, well, it was like, oh, you know, it was no big deal, and, you know, I found somebody, and it was a broker, and, you know, and it worked out great. It, the whole thing only took about six months. Well, the question you need to ask yourself is, how close is that business to you? The odds are each business is unique and has its unique challenges. And so depending on the stir of your buddy or what he got for a quote-unquote multiple of sales or multiple of income, probably has nothing to do with your ability to make a decision when you want to make it on your time frame. Another very sad story that came to us is a gentleman who had built a very successful business over many years. He had all the money he needed. He found out his, his wife was, uh, became, uh, excuse me, uh, end up with a terminal illness. And his decision was, I have to take care of my wife until she's gone. And I can't do that and run the business. I don't know who's going to take over the business. So he shut it down. And about 15 people became unemployed. What a waste. Other business owners, I'm sure we've all heard this, you know, they had a bad year. They're doing okay. They can't, they can't bring themselves to make the investment in the business to turn around, to go through it one more time. And that's it. They turn out the lights. It's an impulsive decision. Without going through, maybe there are incremental things they could do. Maybe there's financing they could have. All the variables that can go. Then on the other end, you have people who say, you know, I'm going to sell the business. I've got a buyer, and, and that's all great. I'm, I'm all lined up. Things are looking good. And uh, when somebody asks them, their advisor asks, what are you going to do? Oh, well, you know, my daughter lives three states away. My wife and I have decided we're going to move there. She's got young kids, and we're going to help them raise their grandchildren. Okay. And when you probe a little further, one of the challenges is, you know, when grandpa comes to visit, the grandkids think it's a great treat, but if grandpa's there all the time, then, you know, that's not, you're not so special anymore. Uh, and the other assumption people make is that suddenly their daughter, whom they raised and intelligent and educated and married and now has children, well, well they're not quite so incompetent at raising children. And so perhaps, rather than assuming that she really needs your help, that maybe not so much, or she needs your help occasionally. And if you go into a situation where that's your plan, I'm going to help my daughter you know, with her kids, and it doesn't work out, where are you? You're stuck. You end up with junk, junk food decision making. So let's take a moment and look at financial risk. So if you're a business owner, and these are statistics that have been put together by a number of organizations and verified in different ways. Most business owners have somewhere between 70 and 80% of their net worth tied up in the business. And most business owners, it's a private business, which makes it an illiquid business. That's extremely risky. There was a study done a couple of years ago in Australia asking business owners over age 50 
um, if they had plans for succession or transition of the business. 78% said they had no plans whatsoever. Uh, while it is in one country, Australia, I've heard similar comments here. I'm sure Kumi has heard similar uh, numbers in, in the Bermuda market. And worst of all, in another study, 60% of business owners had not had any discussion about succession or transition of the business with a spouse, partner, or trusted advisor. That is a huge risk. There are some personal risks. Most are familiar with the expression Velcro, you know, the material that sticks things together. Well, if you're the CEO and you're a man, you're running, used to running things and suddenly you come home and you realize that, you know, in most cases your wife was in charge of running the house and you have a awkward conversation where, you know, wife has built her life. She goes out during the day and if you're sitting there saying, where are you going, hon? What are you going to do, hon? What, you know? And she has, has her own life and her own plans. As uh, one wife said to me, she said, you know, to her husband, uh, I married you for better or for worse, but I didn't, I didn't marry you for lunch. On the other extreme, there are people who have addiction and dependency problems. Um, and while we and the people we're involved with don't typically deal with those issues, those are significant risks. Now, MLS is an expression that's used in the United States, typically means multiple listing service relating to real estate. We don't mean that. This stands for married living separately, where one spouse is living in one state because you're retired and you sort of, you know, the retirement home. The other one is still working in a completely different community, a different state or different part of the country. They're married, but they're not living together. And sadly, all too often, that leads to great divorce, where I'm going to show you a statistic in a moment about a massive growth in that in the baby boom generation. And then, of course, to the extreme level, uh, this statistic I just heard recently, the fastest rate of growth of suicides in the United States, the age group, is now the baby boomers. It's not the very youngest people who typically were the highest or the very oldest people who become despondent with illness and so forth, but it's people like me in their 50s and 60s. So I mentioned gray divorce. So this was a study done by a uh, university here in the United States a few years ago. And the, the divorce rate for those 50 plus, in other words, the boomers, has doubled in the past 20 years. 10% of all divorces in 1990 were by age people 50 plus. It's now 25% of all divorces. And there's no reason to believe just based on my anecdotal evidence of what's happened in my own neighborhood where three of the approximately 30 homes in my neighborhood now have divorces and people are selling the homes because they're getting divorced. Uh, and I hear that anecdotally continually. So another reason people sort of put this off is, you know, they think of the golden years and they think of what maybe what their grandparents did. They worked real hard and then they retired and then they didn't do an awful lot. And for our generation, we don't want that. You know, we want an active, dynamic, interesting, exciting. But in order to make that happen, you have to sort of let go of the old leisure retirement as, well, that's what you're going to go to. So a number of people think, well, that's retirement. I reject that. So instead, I'm going to keep working. Well, I have a slightly different expression for that. When people tell me, I'm going to keep working, you know, until I die, well, this is what they're really saying. The best that I can do with the rest of my life is this guy. Die at my desk. God forbid. I sure hope you don't choose that. What we're asking people to do is something very different. It's actually thinking about a new way of living a paradigm shift. This on the left, this is our traditional way in the Western world we've been brought up. We're educated. We finish our education sometime in our early 20s typically. We then work for 40 years or so and then retire. 
whatever that may mean, the leisure retirement and so on and so forth. Now, what's happening is we are living so much longer, right? The original retirement was put together in Germany and it was designed so that soldiers coming home from the wars wouldn't have a revolution. They could count on a pension. But most of the people who came home from these wars never lived long enough to collect the pension. Well, people are collecting pensions, retirement funds, whatever they want to call it. But if you retire at 65 in the United States today, the odds are you're going to be living another 20 or even 30 years. That's an awful long time to be sitting in a rocking chair and not accomplishing or exploiting, if you will, the great gifts that have been given to you and the skills you've developed. So we have a concept, forget about the golden years, it's about the platinum years. Interesting, exciting, dynamic, if you want to do the work to plan for it. So let's go through a little bit about why owners fail to transition plan. They're afraid to think about leaving. They think it's too early, I've got time. They fear the process will be too complicated. They're simply afraid of an unknown future. I know what I know. I'm good with where I'm at. I don't know what I don't know. I don't want to go there. And then, of course, there's a whole group of business owners. They don't really know the experience advisor. You know, they, they don't know Kumi exists, you know, a leading expert in this process in Bermuda. They could help them create a plan and implement the plan for successful transition. So here are some lessons. Number one, an owner who doesn't take the time to plan, to analyze and compare all their options, may not make the best decision about what to do with the company and may not get the best value for it. Number two, if you don't have a well thought out plan for what you want to do after you leave your company, your life can become boring, unfulfilling, and meaningless. Let me share one story. A gentleman has sold a very successful office supply business. Relatively young, early 60s. He must have been a heck of a salesman because he persuaded his wife to sell their home in New England and to move to, of all places, Las Vegas. So think about that for a moment. A business owner, now worth millions, in a brand new city where he doesn't know anybody, and of all the new cities to choose, Las Vegas. So between golfing at night and the casinos, excuse me, golfing during the day and casinos at night, that's kind of was his plan. He apparently didn't advise his wife that that was his plan. So six months after, they're out there and you know, he's getting ready to go out to the casinos. She marches in and said, you know, in six months that we've lived here, I've made exactly two friends. In the last month, both of them have told me that they're leaving. And guess what? So am I. So she leaves. So now think about the scenario. It's a gentleman worth millions. He's got a lot of time on his hand. His wife just left him, and he's living in Las Vegas. You can only imagine the bad things that happened to this guy. But there is a silver lining. He had a business contact who knew us and brought us in and said, I know you don't like these situations, but if the guy can get a little straightened out, can you really straighten him out? So he had to deal with some issues which we don't deal with. Once that was done, we were able to come in and help the guy figure out a plan. It took about, on our end, about three months. The whole process took a little longer. So he got back together with his wife, and then he decided to start a little business. You're going to laugh when you hear it. The business he decided to buy into was a hot dog stand at a major retailer. <laughs> and he has total carte blanche of when he wants to run the stand and when he doesn't. It's what I call a, it's a light switch business. You turn it on, you're on. You turn it off, you're off. Doesn't matter. And he came up, uh, my business partner met him one time, and he came up and he gave 
Jack a great big bear hug. He said, you know, you fixed in three months what it took me two years to screw up. I hope you don't do that. Lesson number three. And this happens, and I'm sure Kumi has stories in this regard, where someone gets cold feet. They're going through the whole succession selling process, whatever the case may be. And then I can't do it. I can't figure out what I'm going to do next. And they start throwing out excuses about the deal, about this, about timing, whatever. They pull out. Well, that can really damage your reputation, discourage other buyers from working with you, and certainly discourage other mergers and acquisition advisors from wanting to represent you. Number four, owners' unrecognized emotions and fears can sabotage their attempts to leave their business successfully. So when you have a fear of you're not sure if the kids are capable of taking over and you're not addressing the logical business case of situation that you need to deal with that, getting them trained up, what have you, if you're afraid that, you know, the people are going to steal from you while, you know, you're not around, then you haven't put the controls in, or frankly, you haven't hired the right people. You can counterbalance your fears with logic, but you first have to recognize that you have them. So what is a new way of thinking? Those of you looking at this picture will see a glass. Some of you will say it's half full. Others of you will say it's half empty. Actually, it's both. It's half full of air and half full of wine. It's in balance. And that's what we ask people to do, is move away from the traditional thinking, the mechanistic thinking, the balanced thinking. So here are some quotes from some people who've studied this issue or been through this issue. Many of you may recognize the name Lee Iacocca, who is the former CEO of Chrysler. You plan everything in life, and the roof caves in on you because you have not done enough thinking about who you are and what you should do with the rest of your life. Retirement planning is not just about how much money you need, but how you fill your time with worthwhile activities. And from Peter Drucker, who's one of the gurus, founding gurus, if you will, of management consulting, there is one prerequisite to managing the second half of your life. You must begin working on it long before you enter it. So when people ask me, well, gee, Paul, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, what I really do and the people who work in our organization really do is we deliver peace of mind. We help people recognize they can choose a type of freedom. They can create a structure for their life that makes sense, that helps them be happier and be fulfilled, and ultimately to create a great sense of significance in their life. So how do you move forward? Now, we do have a couple of other webinars that will go in greater detail, but this encapsulates things. We call it a holistic success strategy for transitioning or succession planning. Most business owners, before they actually leave, have to make the business better. It has to become transferable, more consistently profitable. And that will take investment, time, money, personnel, and so forth. And you need to Find the kind of consultants and uh, other advisors who will help you make it better. You need to make this transition process matter. Most of you are only going to leave your business once. Uh, I'm just getting a quick update here. There's some questions. Nope, sorry. Um, making it matter relates to our ability to make sure that you have a plan for how to move forward, that the process of leaving the business makes sense to you. Make it last has to do with if you're going to leave your business and going to take an illiquid asset and turning it into either a stream of income over many years and or a lump sum payment, you've got to make that last a long time. As we said, most of us who are in our 
get into our 60s are going to live another 10, 20, 30 years. It's a long time to depend on um, that income stream. And lastly, you have to make it happen. You have to find the people, the experts, advisors, and so forth, who will make sure that your plans that you've put together get implemented. Now, COMP, you may look in here and say, that's not northeast, west, and south for a compass. And that's true. We call this a life compass. This is clarity. O stands for opportunities. M stands for meaning. And P stands for purpose. We believe this represents a holistic success strategy. I'm sorry. I'm, somebody who's got a... Hi, Paul. Um, yes. Paul, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure out how to send you something via chat. Um, okay. We've just got a question that came in by email. Somebody's basically asking about retiring at, let's say, age 60 and how far ahead they should start thinking about succession and transition. I know it's something we're going to touch on um, in, I think, the third webinar around what we're seeing in the marketplace, how long it takes to actually have a transaction. Um, sure. But um, is there anything you can you can talk about there, and 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 also not just about the actual transition and say exiting, uh, whether it's selling or you know passing it on to another generation or passing it on to management or what have you, but what comes after? You know what is what I guess for me, what's what what does the first sort of five years after transitioning look like? In my yeah, great. So. I guess the first part of the question, I did eventually get it here, thank you, Kumi, um, is you know how far ahead it, it, that, I forgive the expression, but it depends where you're at. You know, If your goal, if you're 55 and you own a business and you want to retire in five years, that's great. That's, for most people, that's sufficient time to follow this success strategy, to find out where the holes are in the business, to put the plans in place, if need be, raise the financing. Uh, potentially fire some people who aren't going to be on the on make the transition replace them with the right people or or replace yourself in many cases many business owners are, are too central to the business it, it, it actually hurts the transferability of the business when you're not only the CEO but also the COO and, and, and Kumi frankly could probably speak in a little greater detail which will be part of it but just you know to answer the question in terms of you know what that process of those years, well, you're probably going to be working just as hard as you are now, but you'll be moving towards a process of having other people take on responsibilities. So you're moving into much more of a strategic role as opposed to the tactics of answering the next email, answering the next phone call. You know, you know sales and marketing are fighting with each other once again, and you're trying to balance that, and so on and so on. In terms of what the future looks like after you leave, um, you know, that ultimately comes down to the planning you want to do ahead of time. Um, got a follow-on question. Is what if you don't have as much as you like? Those five years are more like five months. Um, you know, five months is what I would say is you, you first had better figure out what you're going to do after you leave. I mean, if you're as soon as five months away from, from leaving um, and perhaps there's an event already in place, um, you better really focus on what you want to do because if you're in crunch time and you're working crazy hours, you want to have a goal out there that you're going to go to that's something you really want to achieve. And if you don't have a life you're going to move towards that you're really looking forward to do, it will be very easy at the end of this five-month period to pull the plug and get everybody completely annoyed, as we said earlier. Uh, that's from the personal side. On the business side, if you've got a really short window for a variety of reasons, um, you know, Kumi and some of the other financial experts can talk more about, you know, these are things you need to do, you know, protection, ensuring the downside as the case may be, cleaning up some issues. Um, but if you're expecting to sell your business for $20 million and it's only worth, you know, $1 million, the greatest thing will be uh, adjusting your attitude about what the expectations really are. Hope that answered it. Okay. Um, so we're starting to get towards the end here, um, and I know we can open it up to some questions, but I did want to let people know we've got two more webinars coming up, Envisioning a Dynamic Future, which is a, a new approach to leaving, and that's um, next week, same time. 
And the third one is there's still time, and that's going to actually be driven more by Kumi and his experience in terms of logical approach to building and harvesting value, which kind of relates to the questions that we just talked about. Um, so one more question here, um, what about funding post-retirement? So if uh, you're in a position where you have not a lot of liquid assets outside of the business, if you have a certain period of time, hopefully a few years, and you work with the right financial advisors, they can help you take a look at how you're extracting value from the business and see if there's a way to do it in uh, the most preferential way, perhaps from a tax advantage basis, or uh, maybe if it makes more sense uh, to realize that this is a business that can be highly saleable and therefore let's look at building the profitability of the business and then that will help in terms of the multiple you may get. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and again, I'm not a financial expert, so it's really hard to do beyond that. I won't, I won't get into trouble here. Uh, one other question. What can I do to influence my dad who's <laughs> dragging his heels? Okay. So I'm going to say this. Until a man has a place to look forward to, it's a lot easier to just hang on to what you have. And so there's no question that, you know, your father, they love what he does. He's been doing it a long time. And perhaps part of the question you want to ask yourself is, Dad, what would it take for you to have the confidence in me to run this business? Another question might be, Dad, if you were to look at this business over the next 12 to 24 months, what do you think it needs to grow to where it needs to where it needs to grow? And a third question is, you know, Dad, I love you, I have great respect for you, but we both know, you know, you're not gonna live forever. If something happened to you tomorrow, what would you want to happen to this business? What would you want me to do with this business to honor your legacy? Those are very difficult questions. I completely understand where you're coming from. All right, the question is, can you please reiterate about your process? Whoops, I'm going to scroll back up here. Uh, transition planners are essentially navigators who help the business owner make their way. Great question. So um, we have a variety of programs, and we'll talk more about it in greater detail, but the shorthand is um, – we have a, some online assessments you can start out with, which are not very much money. Uh, you, one's called the What's Next Self-Assessment. Uh, we have this workshop, which we think will be terrific, finding a new owner. It's a half-day uh, program. You're going to be getting some more e emails from Kumi about that. We're actually and doing then, two workshops. We're doing the half-day and the two-day as well. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So there's a half-day and there's a follow-on two-day. The half-day... I'll just go into the infomercial part, uh, is we're going to help actually walk you through starting to envision a new future, thinking about it, and then going into some of the business challenges and some perhaps some of the financial challenges, both between me and Kumi and um, Jennifer, financial person. The two-day is much more concrete. It's actually working out that plan. And why, the way this plan, if you will, is sort of this life plan, is where you look at 10 different aspects of your life. Um, everything from activities you do for physical exercise, activities that are leisure activities, activities with spouse, activities with family, uh, volunteer, philanthropy, um, you know, where you choose to live, and then an area that we call paid work because we, we actually believe many people can benefit from some form of paid work. It may not be at the level you've done in the past, or clearly not the economic level, but the point is to have an integrated process of how you're going to connect with other people because when you leave, the vendors and employees and your colleagues and the trade, trade groups and so forth, you don't see them on a regular basis and you're going to lose a lot of those social connections. And so you need to replace those with new social connections. So our programs are designed to help you figure out who you are, and what you really want to do, and who you are process, again, is a, is, is a, is a program you can follow. Uh, some of it's online, some of it can be in person, some of it's in workshop. And the what are you going to do piece is, you know, a very programmatic, we start to take a look at what your fears are, we help you counterbalance your fears, we help you understand how you make decisions 
the upsides and downsides of how you make decisions so you can create more balanced decisions, not the imbalanced decisions, which are some of the stories that we talked about today. And it's through that process that you're able to look at each area of your life, brainstorm, okay, what am I going to do for me, you know, my primary physical activity? What's going to really you know, help keep me healthier? Come up with a whole group of ideas, winnow that down to maybe six, and then take those six and winnow it down to two, and then choose one as your primary. You obviously will have you know, others, but what's going to be your primary one? And you use that same process for each lifestyle area that you go through, and then you have to look at all of this, and then it has to fit. It's basically a pie with 10 slices, and you have to be able to fit each of the lifestyle areas in so it makes sense. And then, of course, if assuming you're married or have a partner, you know, your partner needs to do something similar, if not exactly the same, and then you need to have convergence so that the plans you want for your life are in alignment with your plans for what your spouse wants for his or her life, and now you're able to have this really beautiful new future you can move towards. Uh, okay. Not seeing anything else coming in, Paul. Yeah, so uh, the last part is, you know, in areas personal and finance. Um, again, I don't deal with the, the finance piece. Uh, we definitely deal on the personal side, but in terms of how you um, fund the life you want, I, and I've talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of financial advisors over the years, and they continually tell me their biggest frustrations where they ask people, you know, what do you want to do? What are your goals going forward? They tend to get either, you know, a blank stare or pablum. You know, it's not, not definite. And what our process to, is to really define very concrete, you know, I've, I've looked about it, this is where I want to live, or if you are a financial means, this is where I'm going to live on the winter, and this is where I'm going to live the rest of the year, or vice versa. Or, you know, this is a realistic basis of what I can get uh, if I were to sell my business, or this is what my income is realistically going to look like. Uh, from a buyout. When you have, you know, those hard numbers, if you are, and then you have, you know, written plans about what you really want to do in your life that match what your spouse wants to do in his or her life, you sit down with a financial advisor and you've just eliminated about 50% of the headaches the financial advisors have to deal with. And they can really just focus on putting together the right financial plans and investment plans and so forth to help you actually, fi uh, excuse me, you know, finance, if you will, the life that you want to live. So, so actually, let me take that opportunity really quickly, just again to, because I didn't do it at the beginning, just to say thanks again to Patterson Partners for helping to sponsor, um, uh, not just the webinars, but the workshops as well, um, because they are actually uh, financial planners locally. And um, and obviously, uh, with from advice, we assist with uh, business valuation and, and more, more importantly, for these cases, business brokerage when there are transactions taking place. Um, what, what, the reason that we reached out to, to Paul and to Jack um, was that we felt, again, that people really, that what we kept hearing or what we kept seeing was that people really needed help from somebody who had, a vet, who had an interest in them and in their success, who wasn't interested in whose interest wasn't necessarily biased by a chase for professional fees or anything, you know, legal fees, accounting fees, anything like that, but just with helping have the best possible outcomes for the business owner because um, most business owners, if they're transitioning, are not necessarily transitioning multiple times, certainly not necessarily selling businesses or, or, or making significant life changes in their life plans or the way their lifestyle uh, is, is sort, sort of goes um, multiple times. And, and we've, we've seen a lot of people who've had regrets or who've had un challenges that could have been avoided. And um, we're, we're hopeful that, that um, STPI, whether, whether people come to the workshops or they, after, after the workshops decide they want to reach out and, and get one-on-one -on -one confidential sort of assistance in navigating the process that they'll follow up with these guys. Um, and we really hope that helps to alleviate some of the issues we're seeing in the local business community um, with people who are exiting and not necessarily getting the best outcomes. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And once again, Kumi, thanks for inviting me today. I know we're getting uh, close to the end of our time here. Uh, but these are the three firms. The Platinum Years is our brand. That's also our website, theplatinumyears.com. If you're so inclined to visit us, please do. We're also available on, on Twitter and Facebook. And this is Kumi's firm, Firm Advisory, and then, of course, Patterson Partners. Uh, so we are having some workshops uh, here in Bermuda. And, and uh, Kumi's been put up some information there about where to learn more. 
about the workshops. And uh, once again, we certainly hope that you will join us for our next webinars, uh, September 23rd, Envisioning a Dynamic Future. And September 30th, there is still time. So uh, unless there are any other questions, I think we are uh, have sort of come to the end here. Yeah, you can either email us, um, give a call, or um, the, this, the Facebook page has all the information, all the registration information. It's just facebook.com forward slash uh, TPBBO, as in Transition Planning for business, Bermuda Business Owners. Um, thanks a lot for your time, and uh, have a great day, folks. And oh, we, will be re we did record this, and we will make this available um, for download and for sharing. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kumi. Bye now. Thanks, Paul. Cheers.